May it please the tribunal. Before I tender the evidence which I desire to place before the tribunal, it might be convenient if I explained how the British case is to be divided up and who will present the different parts. I shall deal with the general treaties. After that, my learned friend, Colonel Griffith Jones, will deal with Poland. Thirdly, Mr. Elwyn Jones will deal with Norway and Denmark. Fourth, Mr. Roberts will deal with Belgium, Holland and Luxembourg. Fifthly, Colonel Fillimore will deal with Greece and Yugoslavia. After that, my friend Mr. Alderman of the American delegation will deal on behalf of both delegations with the aggression against the USSR and the USA. May I also, with the tribunal's permission, say one word about the arrangements that we have made as to documents. Each of the defendant's counsel will have a copy of the document book, of the different document books in English. In fact, 30 copies of the first four of our document books have already been placed in the Defendant's Information Center. We hope that the last document book dealing with Greece and Yugoslavia will have the 30 copies placed there today. In addition, the defendant's counsel will have at least six copies in German. Of every document. With regard to my own part of the case, the first section on general treaties, all the documents on this phase are in the Reichsgesetzblatt or the Documenta der Deutschen Politik, of which Ten copies have been made available to the Defendant's Council. So that with regard to the portion with which the Tribunal is immediately concerned, the Defendant's Council will have 
at least 16 copies in German of every document referred to. There is, uh, finally, there is a copy of the Reich, Reich Gesetzblatt and the Documenta available for the tribunal, or other copies if they're so desired, but one is placed ready for the tribunal if any member wishes to refer to a German text. Oral witnesses? No, my lord, no oral witnesses. If the tribunal pleases, bef before I come to the first treaty, I want to make three quotations to deal with a point which was mentioned in the speech of my learned friend, the Attorney General, yesterday. It might be thought from the melancholy story of broken treaties and violated assurances, which the tribunal has already heard, that Hitler and the Nazi government did not even profess that it is necessary or desirable to keep the pledged word. Outwardly, however, the professions were very different. With regard to treaties, on the 18th of October, 1933, Hitler said, whatever we have signed, we will fulfill to the best of our ability. The tribunal will note the reservation, whatever we have signed. But on the 21st of May of 1935, Hitler said, the German government will scrupulously maintain every treaty voluntarily signed, even though it was concluded before their accession to power and office. On assurances, Hitler was even more emphatic. In the same speech, the Reichstag speech on May 21st, 1935, Hitler accepted assurances as being of equal obligation. And the world at that time could not know that that meant of no obligation at all. What he actually said was, and when I now hear from the lips of a British statesman that such assurances are nothing and that the only proof of sincerity is the signature appended to collective pacts, 
I must ask Mr. Eden to be good enough to remember that it is a question of an assurance in any case. It is sometimes much easier to sign treaties with the mental reservations that one will reconsider one's attitude at the decisive hour than to declare before an entire nation and with full opportunity, one's adherence to a policy which serves the course of peace because it rejects anything which leads to war. And then he proceeds with the illustration of his assurance to France. Therefore, having seen the importance which Hitler wished the world to believe he attached to treaties, I shall ask the tribunal in my part of the case to look at 15 only of the treaties which he and the Nazis broke. The remainder of the 69 broken treaties shown on the chart and occurring between 1933 and 1941 will be dealt with by my learned friends. There is one final point as to the position of a treaty in German law, as I understand it. The appearance of a treaty in the Reich Gesetzblatt makes it part of the statute law of Germany <clears throat> and that is by no means an uninteresting aspect of the breaches which I shall put before the tribunal. The first treaty to be dealt with is the Convention for the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes signed at The Hague on the 29th of July, 1899. I ask that the tribunal will take judicial notice of the convention and for convenience, I hand in as exhibit GB1 the British document TC1, the German reference is to the Reich Gesetzblatt for 191, number 44, section 401 to 404, and 482 and 483. And the tribunal will find the 
relevant charge in Appendix C is charge 1. As the Attorney General said yesterday, these Hague Conventions are only the first gropings towards the rejection of the inevitability of war. <coughs> they do not brand the making of aggressive war as a crime, but their milder terms were as readily broken as the more severe agreements. On the 29th July, 1899, Germany, Greece, Serbia, and 25 other nations signed the convention. Germany ratified the convention on the 4th September, 1900. Serbia on the 11th May 1901, Greece on the 4th April 1901. With regard to Serbia and Yugoslavia, by Article 12 of the treaty between the principal allied and associated powers, and the Serb-Croat-Slovene state, signed at Saint-Germain on the 10th of September 1919, the new kingdom succeeded to all the old Serbian treaties, and later, as the tribunal know, changed its name to Yugoslavia. I think it is sufficient, unless the tribunal otherwise wish, for me to read the first two articles only. Article 1, with a view to obviating, as far as possible, recourse to force in the relation between states. The signatory powers agree to use their best efforts to ensure the pacific settlement of international differences. Article 2. In case of serious disagreement or conflict, before an appeal to arms, the signatory powers agree to have recourse as far as circumstances allow to the good offices or mediation of one or more friendly powers. After that, the convention um, deals with machinery. I don't think subject to any wish of the tribunal that it's necessary for me to deal with it in detail. The second treaty is the Convention for the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes signed at The Hague on the 18th of October 1907. Again, ask the tribunal to take judicial notice of this and for convenience hand in as exhibit GB2 the final act of the conference at The Hague which contains British documents TC2, 3 and 4. The reference to this 
Convention in German is to the Reich Gesetzblatt for 1910, number 52, sections 22 to 25. And the relevant charge is charge 2. This convention was signed at The Hague by 44 nations and it is in effect as to 31 nations, 28 signatories and three adherents. For our purposes, it is in force as to the United States, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, France, Germany, Luxembourg, Japan, Netherlands, Norway and Poland, and Russia. And by the provisions <coughs> of Article 91, it replaces the 1899 Convention as between the contracting powers. But as Greece and Yugoslavia are parties to the 1899 Convention and not to the 1907, the 1899 Convention is in effect with regard to them. And that explains the division of countries in Appendix C. Again, I only desire to, that the Tribunal should look at the first two articles. One, with a view to obviating, as far as possible, recourse to force in the relations between states, the contracting powers agree to use their best efforts to ensure the pacific settlement of international differences. Then I don't think I need trouble to read two. It's the same article as to mediation. And again, there are a number of machinery provisions. The third treaty is the Hague Convention relative to the opening of hostilities signed at the same time. It is contained in the exhibit which I put in. Again, I ask that judicial notice be taken of it. British document is TC3. The German reference is to the Reich Gesetzblatt for 1910, number 2, sections 82 to 102. And the reference in Appendix C to charge 3. This convention applies to Germany, Poland, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Russia. It relates to a procedural step notifying one's prospective opponent before opening hostilities against him. It appears to have had its immediate origin in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 when Japan attacked Russia without any previous warning. It will be noted that it does not fix any particular lapse of time between the giving of the notice and the commencement of, it, of hostilities, but it does seek to maintain an absolutely minimum standard of international decency before the outbreak of war. And again, if I might refer the tribunal to the first article, 
the contracting powers recognize that hostilities between them must not commence without a previous and explicit warning in the form of either a declaration of war giving reasons or an ultimatum with a conditional declaration of war. Then there are a number, again, of machinery provisions which I shall not trouble the tribunal. The fourth treaty is the Hague, is Hague Convention 5 respecting the rights and duties of neutral powers and persons in case of war on, on land, signed at the same time. That is British document TC4, and the German reference is the Reich Gesetzblatt 1910, number 2, sections 168 and 176. Reference in Appendix C is to charge four. Is it necessary to give the German reference for the? No, I, I, not if uh, I don't want. I don't to know whether it's necessary for the purposes of defence counsel, but if not, yeah, it needn't be done. If uh, if I, if I may omit them, it will save some time. Yes. And if anyone asks, wants anyone, perhaps if any of the defence counsel want any specific reference, perhaps they'll be good enough to ask me. Yes. The if Germany was an original signatory to the convention and the treaty is in force as a result of ratification or adherence between Germany and Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, the USSR and the United States. And I call the attention of the tribunal to the short content of Article 1, the, the territory of neutral powers is inviolable. A point does arise, however, on this convention. I want to make clear at once. Under Article 20, the provisions of the present convention do not apply except between contracting powers and then only if all the belligerents are parties to the convention. As um, Great Britain and France entered the war within two days of the outbreak of the war between Germany and Poland. And one of these powers had not ratified the convention. It is arguable that its provisions did not apply to the Second World War. I don't want that the time of the tribunal should be occupied by an argument on that point when the, there are so many more important treaties to be considered. And therefore, I do not press charge four as a charge of a breach of treaty. I merely call the attention of the tribunal to the terms of Article One as showing the state of international opinion at that time and as an element in the aggressive character of the war which we are considering. That, that would be a good time to break off. As the tribunal adjourned, I had come to the fifth treaty, the Treaty of Peace between the Allied and Associated Powers in Germany, signed at Versailles on the 28th of June 1919. Again asked the tribunal to take judicial cognizance of this treaty and 
again hand in for convenience exhibit GB3, which is a copy of the treaty, including the British documents TC5 to TC10 inclusive. And the reference in Appendix C is to Charge 5. Before I deal with the relevant portions, may I explain very briefly the layout of the treaty. Part 1 contains the Covenant of the League of Nations, and Part 2 sets the boundaries of Germany in Europe, these boundaries are described in detail, but part two makes no provision for guaranteeing these boundaries. Part three, articles 31 to 117, with which the tribunal is concerned, contains the political clauses for Europe. In it, Germany guarantees certain territorial boundaries in Belgium, Luxembourg, Austria, Czechoslovakia, France, Poland, Memo, Danzig, etc. It might be convenient for the tribunal to note at the moment the interweaving of this treaty with the next, which is the Treaty for the Restoration of Friendly Relations between the United States and Germany. Parts 1, 2 and 3 of the Versailles Treaty are not included in the United States Treaty. Parts 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, and 15 are all repeated verbatim in the United States Treaty from the Treaty of Versailles. The Tribunal is concerned with Part 5, which are the military, naval, and air clauses. <coughs> Parts 7 and 13 are not included in the United States Treaty. I don't think there's any reason to explain what the parts are, but if uh, any, if the Tribunal want to know about any sp specific part, I should be very happy to explain it. The first part th that the tribunal is concerned with is that contained in the British document TC5, which is, and consists of articles 42 to 44, dealing with the Rhineland. They're very short, and as they're repeated in the Locarno Treaties, perhaps I'd better read them once, just so the tribunal will have them in mind. Article 42. Germany is forbidden to maintain or construct any fortifications, either on the left bank of the Rhine, or on the right bank to the west of a line drawn 50 kilometres to the east of the Rhine. Article 43. In the area defined above, the maintenance and the assembly of armed forces, either permanently or temporarily, and military manoeuvres of any kind, as well as the upkeep of all permanent works for mobilisation, are in the same way forbidden. Article 44. In case Germany violates in any manner whatever the provisions of Articles 42 and 43, she shall be regarded as committing a hostile act against the powers signatory of the present treaty 
and is calculated to disturb the peace of the world. The, uh, I'm not going to put in evidence, but I simply draw the tribunal's attention to a document of which they can take judicial notice as it has been publicly published by the German state, the memorandum of March 7th, 1936, giving their account of the breach. The matters in breach of the, regarding the breach have been dealt with by my friend Mr. Alderman, and I don't propose to go over the ground again. The next um, um, part of the treaty is in um, the British document TC6, dealing with Austria, Article 80. Germany acknowledges and will respect strictly the independence of Austria within the frontiers which may be fixed in a treaty between that state and the principal allied and associated powers. She agrees that this independence shall be inalienable, except with the consent of the Council of the League of Nations. Again, in the same way, the proclamation of Hitler dealing with Austria, with the background of which has been dealt with by my friend, Mr. Alderman, is attached as TC 47, and I do not intend to read it because the tribunal can take, again, take judicial notice of the public proclamation. The next is document TC 8, dealing with memo. Germany renounces in favor of the principal allied and associated powers all rights and title over the territories included between the Baltic, the northeastern frontier of East Prussia, as defined in Article 28 of Part 2, Boundaries of Germany, of the present treaty, and the former frontier between Germany and Russia. Germany undertakes to accept the settlement made by the principal allied and associated powers in regard to these territories, particularly in so far as concerns the nationality of inhabitants. I don't think that the tribunal has had um, any reference to the formal document of incorporation of memo, which, uh, which again, the, the tribunal can take judicial notice, and I put in for convenience a copy as GB4. It's a British document TC 53A, and it appears on in our book. It's very short, so perhaps the tribunal would bear with me while I read it. The transfer commissioner for the memo territory, Gauleiter and Oberpräsident Eric Koch, effected on 3rd April 1939, during a conference at Memo, the final incorporation of the late Memo territory into the National, National Socialist Party Gau of East Prussia and into the state administration of the East Prussian Regierungsbezirk of Grand Benin. The, um, then, we, the next, we come to TC9, which is the article relating to Danzig, Article 100. The, and I shall only read the first sentence because the remainder <coughs> are geog consists of geographical boundaries. Germany renounces in favor of the principal allied and associated powers all rights and title over the territory comprised within the following limits, and then the limits are set out and are described in a German map attached to the treaty. The, 
the, Colonel Griffith Jones, who will deal with the, this part of the case, will formally prove the documents relating to the occupation of Dancy, and I shan't trouble the tribunal with them now. So if the tribunal would go on to British document TC7, that is Article 81, dealing with the Czechoslovak state. Germany, in conformity with the action already taken by the Allied and Associated Powers, recognizes the complete independence of the Czechoslovak state, which will include the autonomous territory of the Ruthenians to the south of the Carpathians. Germany hereby recognizes the frontiers of this state as determined by the principal Allied and Associated Powers and other, interesting state, uh, other interested states. The, uh, Mr. Alderman has dealt with uh, the, this matter only this morning, and he has <coughs> already put in uh, exhibit giving in detail the conference between Hitler and uh, President Hasha and the Foreign Minister Schwarkowski at which um, the defendants, Goering, Keitel, um, and Keitel were present. But, and therefore I'm not going to put into the tribunal the British translation of the captured Foreign Office minutes, which occurs in TC 48. But uh, I put in, um, formally, as Mr. Alderman asked me to this morning, as GB 6, the document TC 49, which is the agreement signed by Hitler and the defendant Ribbentrop for Germany and Dr. Hasha and Dr. Schwarkowski for Czechoslovakia. It is an agreement of which the tribunal will take uh, judicial notice. I'm afraid I can't quite remember if Mr. Alderman read it and I'm, this morning. It's the document TC 49. He certainly referred to it. He didn't read it. No, he didn't read it. He didn't read it. Then perhaps um, I might read it. Text of the agreement between the Führer and Reichs and Chancellor Adolf Hitler and the President of the Czechoslovak State, Dr. Hasha. The Führer and Reich's Chancellor today received in Berlin, at their own request, the President of the Czechoslovak State, Dr. Hasha, and the Czechoslovak Foreign Minister, Dr. Schwarkowski, in the presence of Herr von Ribbentrop, the Foreign Minister of the Reich. At this meeting, the serious situation which had arisen within the previous territory of Czechoslovakia, owing to the events of recent weeks, was subjected to a completely open examination. The conviction was unanimously expressed on both sides that the object of all their efforts must be to assure quiet, order and peace in this part of Central Europe. The president of the Czechoslovak state declared that in order to serve this end and to reach a final pacification, he confidently placed the fate of the Czech people and of their country in the hands of the Führer of the German Reich. The Führer accepted this declaration and expressed his decision to assure to the Czech people, under the protection of the German Reich, the autonomous development of their national life in accordance with their special characteristics. In witness whereof, this document is signed in duplicate, and the signatures I've mentioned appear. The tribunal will understand that it is not my province to make any comment. That has been done by Mr. Alderman, and I am not putting forward any of the documents I read as having 
um, my support. They are merely put forward factually as part of the case. <coughs> the next um, document which I put in as GB7 is the British document number 50. That is Hitler's proclamation to the German people dated the 15th of March 1939. Again, I don't think that Mr. Alderman read that document and uh, I should... No, you didn't read it. No. Then I shall read it. Proclamation of the Führer to the German people, 15th March 1939. <coughs> to the German people, only a few months ago, Germany was compelled to protect her fellow countrymen living in well-defined settlements against the unbearable Czechoslovakian terror regime. And during the last weeks, the same thing has happened on an ever-increasing scale. This is bound to create an intolerable state of affairs within an area inhabited by citizens of so many nationalities. These national groups, to counteract the renewed attacks against their freedom and life, have now broken away from the Prague government. Czechoslovakia has ceased to exist. Since Sunday, at many places, wild excesses have broken out, amongst the victims of which are again many Germans. Hourly, the number of oppressed and persecuted people crying for help is increasing. From areas thickly populated by German-speaking inhabitants, which last autumn Czechoslovakia was allowed by German generosity to retain, refugees robbed of their personal belongings are streaming into the right continuation of such a state of affairs would lead to the destruction of every vestige of order in an area in which Germany is vitally interested, particularly as for over a thousand years it formed a part of the German Reich. In order definitely to remove this menace to peace, and to create the conditions for a necessary new order in this living space, I have today resolved to allow German troops to march into Bohemia and Moravia. They will disarm the terror gangs <coughs> and the Czechoslovakian forces supporting them and protect the lives of all who are menaced. Thus, they will lay the foundations for introducing a fundamental reordering of affairs which will be in accordance with the thousand-year-old history and will satisfy the practical needs of the German and Czech peoples. Signed Adolf Hitler, Berlin, 15th March, 1939. And uh, then there is a footnote, an order of the Führer to the German armed forces of the same date, in which um, the, uh, the substance is that they are told to march in to safeguard lives and property of all inhabitants and not to conduct themselves as enemies but for an instrument for carrying out the German Reich government's decision. Then the I <clears throat> put in as GB8 the decrees establishing 
the protectorate, TC 51, and uh, I don't, <clears throat> I, th I think again, as these are public decrees, the tribunal can take judicial knowledge of them, and their substance has been fully explained by Mr. Alderman. With the permission of the tribunal, I won't read them in full now. And uh, then, again, as Mr. Alderman requested, I put in as GB9, British document TC52, the British protest, and if I might just read that to the tribunal, it is from Lord Halifax to Sir Neville Henderson, our ambassador in Berlin, Foreign Office, March 17th, 1939. Please inform German government that His Majesty's government desire to make it plain to them that they cannot but regard the events of the past few days as a complete repudiation of the Munich Agreement and a denial of the spirit in which the negotiators of that agreement bound themselves to cooperate for a peaceful settlement. His Majesty's government must also take this occasion to protest against the changes effected in Czechoslovakia by German military action, which are, in their view, devoid of any basis of reality. <clears throat> and again, as Mr. Alderman's request, I put in as GB10 the document TC53, which is the French protest of the same date. Um, and if I might read the third paragraph, the French ambassador has the honor to inform the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Reich of the formal protest made by the government of the French Republic against the measures which the communication of Count de Welzec records. The government of the Republic Consider, in fact, that in face of the action directed by the German government against Czechoslovakia, they are confronted with a flagrant violation of the letter and the spirit of the agreement signed at Munich on September, it should be 29th, 1938. The circumstances in which the agreement of March 15th have been imposed on the leaders of the Czechoslovak Republic do not, in the eyes of the government of the Republic, legalize the situation registered in that agreement. The French ambassador has the honor to inform His Excellency, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Reich, that the government of the Republic cannot recognize under these conditions the legality of the new situation created in Czechoslovakia by the action of the German Reich. I now come to the part five of the Versailles Treaty, and they, the, the relevant matters are contained in the British document TC 10. <coughs> <clears throat> and as considerable discussion is centered round them, 
I read the introductory words. Part 5, Military, Naval and Air Clauses. In order to render possible the initiation of a general limitation of the armaments of all nations, Germany undertakes strictly to observe the military, naval and air clauses which follow. Section 1, Military Clauses. Chapter 1, Effectives and Card of the German Army. Article 159, the German military forces shall be demobilized and reduced as prescribed hereinafter. 160. By a date which must not be later than March 31st, 1920, the German army must not comprise more than seven divisions of infantry and three divisions of cavalry. After that date, the total number of effectives in the army of the, of the states constituting Germany must not exceed 100,000 men, including officers and establishments of depot. The army shall be devoted exclusively to the maintenance of order within the territory and to the control of the frontiers. The total effective strength of officers including the personnel of staffs, whatever their composition, must not exceed 4,000. Two divisions and army corps headquarters staffs shall be organized in accordance with table number one annexed to this section. The number and strengths of the units of infantry, artillery, engineers, technical services, and troops laid down in the aforesaid table constitute maxima which must not be exceeded. Then the, the description of units that um, can have their own depot and uh, the grouping of divisions <coughs> under corps headquarters. And then the, the next two um, provisions are of some importance. The maintenance of formation of forces differently grouped or of other organizations for the command of troops or for preparation for war is forbidden. The great German general staff and all similar organizations shall be dissolved and may not be reconstituted in any form. Then I don't think I need trouble the tribunal with um, Article 161, which um, deals with administrative services. 163 um, provides uh, the steps by which the reduction will take place. And then we come to chapter two, dealing with armament, and that fixes up to the time of which Germany is admitted as a member of the League of Nations, the armaments should not be greater than the amount fixed in table number 11. And if tribunal will note the second part, Germany agrees that after she has become a member of the League of Nations, the armaments fixed in the said table shall remain in force until they are modified by the Council of the League. Furthermore, she hereby agrees strictly to observe the decisions of the Council of the League on this subject. Then 165 deals with guns and machine guns, etc. And 167 deals with notification of guns. Then 168, the first part, we say, we, says that the manufacture of arms, munitions, or any war material shall only be carried out in factories or works, the location of which shall be communicated to and approved by the governments of the principal allied and associated powers, and the number of which they retain the right to restrict. And the 
169 deals with the surrender of material, 170 prohibits importation, 171 prohibits gas, and 172 provides for disclosure. Then 173 under the heading Recruiting and Military Training deals with one matter, the breach of which is of great importance. Universal compulsory military service shall be abolished in Germany. The German army may only be constituted and recruited by means of voluntary enlistment. Then the succeeding articles deal with the method of enlistment in order to prevent a quick rush through the army of men enlisted for a short time. And I think all that I need do is to draw the attention of the tribunal to the completeness and detail with which all these points are covered in Articles 174 to 179. Then passing to TC 10, Article 180, that unites the prohibition of uh, fortress works beyond a certain limit and the Rhineland. The first sentence is, all fortified works, fortresses and field works situated in German territory to the west of a line drawn 50 kilometers to the east of the Rhine shall be disarmed and dismantled. Then I shan't trouble the tribunal with the tables which show the amounts. And then we come to the naval clauses I'm sorry to say that there seem the pages have got out of order. You go on, if you go on four, the tribunal will be good enough to go on four pages. They come to Article 181. And I'll just read that to show the way in which the naval limitations are imposed. I'll refer briefly to the others. Article 181 says, after the expiration of a period of two months from the coming into force of the Commission must not exceed six battleships of the Deutschland or Lothringen type, six light cruisers, twelve destroyers, twelve torpedo boats, or an equal number of ships constructed to replace them as provided in Article 190. No submarines are to be included. All other warships, except where there, there is provision to the contrary in the present treaty, must be placed in reserve or devoted to commercial purposes. Then 182 simply deals with the mine sweeping necessary to clear up the mines. And 183 um, limits the personnel to 15,000, including officers and men of all grades and corps. And 100, 184 deals with surface ships not in German port. And the succeeding clauses deal with various details. And I pass at once to Article 191, which says that the construction of uh, construction or acquisition of any submarines, even for commercial purposes, shall be forbidden in Germany. And 194 makes corresponding um, obligation of voluntary engagements for long service. And 196 and 197 deal with fortifications, naval fortifications and wireless stations.
Then, if the tribunal please, would they pass to Article 198, the first of the air clauses. The essential and important sentence is the first. The armed forces of Germany must not include any military or naval air forces. I don't think that I need trouble the tribunal with the detailed provisions which occur in the next four clauses, which are all consequential. Then the next document which for convenience is um, uh, to put um, next to that is uh, the British document TC44, which uh, for convenience I put in a copy as GB11. But this again is merely ancillary to Mr. Alderman's argument. It's the formal um, um, statement, report of the formal statement made at the German Air Ministry about the restarting of the Air Force. And uh, I think, uh, respectfully submit, the Tribunal can take judicial notice of that. <coughs> and similarly, the, w without um, proving formally the long document TC45, the Tribunal can again take judicial notice of the public proclamation, which is a, a well-known public document in Germany, of the um, proclamation of compulsory military service, service. Mr. Alderman has again dealt with this in, uh, fully in his address. I now come to the sixth tre treaty, which is the treaty between the United States and Germany restoring friendly relations. And uh, that is, I put in a copy as exhibit GB12. It is document TC11, and the tribunal will find it as the second last document in the document book. Um, the purpose of this treaty <coughs> was to complete official cessation of hostilities between the United States of America and Germany. And I've already explained to the tribunal that it incorporated certain parts of the Treaty of Versailles, the relevant portion for the consideration of the tribunal is part five, and I have just concluded going through the clauses of the Treaty of Versailles, which are repeated verbatim in this treaty. I therefore, with the <coughs> approval of the tribunal, will not read them again. But uh, if the, it's a, at page, at page nine, no, uh, page 11, you will see that the, of my, my copy, the, clause, the clauses are repeated in exactly the same way. Mr. Turner, we don't have a copy in our book, I want to be, we have one with Austria, we don't have uh, it's a th it ought to be, I'm, I'm so sorry, it ought to be the second last document in the book. No. Oh, well, may I pass you, uh, you pass mine? I'm so sorry. I'll see. D does, uh, does that apply, Your Honour, to the learned American associate judge? If so, I'll get another document. So, I'm so sorry.
But then uh, um, I pass to the um, seventh treaty, which is the treaty of mutual guarantee between Germany, Belgium, France, Great Britain, and Italy, done at Locarno on the 16th of October, 1925. I asked the tribunal to take judicial notice of that, and I put in exhibit 13, which is GB 13, the British document TC 12. It might be convenient if I... Mr. Attorney, at some later stage, you will have the, all the members of the tribunal furnished with a copy of this treaty between the United States and Germany. Well, if your lordship pleases, I'm sorry, I thought it was only two that we were deficient no, in. No, I think the Soviet member and his uh, alternate have got uh, the Austrian one, and uh, my alternate, Mr. Justice Burkitt's got uh, the Austrian one. I, I think I'm I am the only one who's got the German one. I'm very sorry I'm, that um, I'll see that... Um, I'm not quite sure about the French member. Oh, uh, the, uh, I'm so sorry, Lord. I'll see that the, that the American treaty is, is sent in. Very well. As, uh, as far as, uh, of course, it, it will be done at once, but as far as reference is concerned, the tribunal will appreciate that the clauses are word for word, the Versailles clauses, so if they wish to refer to it in the meantime, they will find them under the clauses of Versailles. But I, that, that won't make any difference, of course, Lord, to my yeah. procuring a copy of the treaty. Now, the, um, the, the I, I was dealing with the Treaty of Locarno, and uh, it might be convenient if I just reminded the tribunal of the treaties that were negotiated as Locarno, because they do all go together and are, to a certain extent, um, mutually dependent. At, uh, at Locarno, Germany negotiated five treaties. A, the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee between Germany, Belgium, France, Great Britain and Italy. B, the Arbitration Convention between Germany and France. C, the Arbitration Convention between Germany and Belgium. D, an Arbitration Treaty between Germany and Poland. And E, an Arbitration Treaty between Germany and Czechoslovakia. Article 10 of the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee provided that it should come into force as soon as ratifications were deposited at Geneva in the archives of the League of Nations and as soon as Germany became a member of the League of Nations. The ratifications were deposited on the 14th September 1926 and Germany became a member of the League of Nations on the 10th of September 1926. The two arbitration conventions and the two arbitration treaties, which I mentioned, provide that they shall enter into force under the same conditions as the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee. That's Article 21 of the Arbitration Conventions and Article 22 of the Arbitration Treaties. The most important of the five agreements is the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee. One of its purposes was to establish in perpetuity the borders between Germany and Belgium and Germany and France. It contains no provision for denunciation or withdrawal therefrom and provides that it shall remain in force until the Council of the League of Nations decides that the League of Nations ensures sufficient protection to the parties to the treaty, an event which never happened, in which case the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee 
shall expire one year later. In the, the general scheme of the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee is that Article 1 provides that the parties guarantee three things, the border between Germany and France, the border between Germany and Belgium, and the demilitarization of the Rhineland. Article 2 provides that Germany and France and Germany and Belgium agree that they will not attack or invade each other with certain inapplicable exceptions. And Article 3 provides that Germany and France and Germany and Belgium agree to settle all disputes between them by peaceful means. <clears throat> and the tribunal will remember, because this point was made by my friend Mr. Alderman, that the first important violation of the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee appears to have been the entry of German troops into the Rhineland on 7th March 1936. The day after, France and Belgium asked the League of Nations Council to consider the question of the German reoccupation of the Rhineland and the perpetrated repudiation of the treaty. And on the 12th of March, after a protest from the British Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Belgium, France, Great Britain and Italy recognised unanimously that the reoccupation was a violation of this treaty. And on the 14th of March, the League Council <coughs> duly and properly decided that it was not permissible and that the Rhineland clauses of the pact were not voidable by Germany because of the alleged violation by France through the Franco-Soviet Mutual Assistance Pact. That is the background to the treaty with the international organizations that were then in force and if I might suggest them to the tribunal without adding to the summary which I've given the relevant articles are one two and three which I have mentioned four which provides for, action, for bringing a violation before the Council of the League, as was done, and the five, <clears throat> I re re ask the tribunal to note, because it uh, deals with the clauses of uh, the Versailles Treaty, which I've already mentioned. It says the provisions of Article 3 of the present treaty are placed under the guarantee of the high contracting parties as provided by the following stipulations. If one of the powers referred to in Article 3 refuses to submit a dispute to peaceful settlement, or to comply with an arbitral or judicial decision and commits a violation of Article 2 of the present treaty or a breach of Articles 42 or 43 of the Treaty of Versailles, the provisions of Article 4 of the present treaty shall apply. That is the procedure of going to the League or in the case of a flagrant breach of taking more stringent action. I remind the tribunal of this provision because of the quotation from
from Hitler, which I mentioned earlier, when he said that the German government will scrupulously maintain every treaty voluntarily signed, even though it was concluded before their accession to power and office. Whatever may be said of the Treaty of Versailles, whatever may be argued and has been argued, no one has ever argued for a moment, to the best of my knowledge, that Herr Stresemann was in any way acting involuntarily when he signed, along with the other representatives, the Locarno Pact on behalf of Germany. It was signed not only by Herr Stresemann, but uh, by Herr Hans Luther. <coughs> So that there you had a treaty freely entered, entered into which repeats the Rhineland provisions of Versailles and binds Germany in that regard. <coughs> I simply call the attention of the tribunal to Article 8, which deals with the <coughs> remaining in force of the treaty. Now, I perhaps might read it because, as I told the tribunal, all the other treaties have the same lasting quality, the same provision as the time they'll last, as uh, the, the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee. It says, the present treaty shall be registered at the League of Nations in accordance with the covenant of the League. It shall remain in force until the Council acting on a request by one or other of the high contracting parties, notified to the other signatory powers three months in advance, and voting at least by a two-thirds majority, decides that the League of Nations ensures sufficient protection to the high contracting parties. The treaty shall cease to have effect on the expiration of a period of one year from such decision. That is that in signing this treaty, the German representatives clearly placed the question of repudiation or avoidance of the treaty in hands other than their own. They were at the time, of course, a member of the League and a member of the Council of the League, but they left the repudiation and avoidance to the decision of the League. Well, <clears throat> then the, the next treaty on my list is the arbitration treaty between Germany and Czechoslovakia, which was one of the Locarno group and which I've already referred. But uh, I, for convenience, I put in exhibit GB 14, which is British document TC 14, as a breach of this treaty is charged in charge eight of Appendix C. I, I mentioned the background of the treaty, and I shan't go into it again, but I think the clauses, the only clauses that the tribunal need look at are Article One, which is the governing clause, says all disputes to document TC 14 all disputes of every kind between Germany and Czechoslovakia with regard to which the parties are Does in conflict TC, uh, 14 follow TC 12 immediately in the book no I'm sorry it's um, it's been it's rather it's much nearer the end of the book uh, it's after the Kellogg Brown pack yes it's after that to uh, before, after TC 18? 
Yes, it's a, it's a midget. It's after TC 18 and, and TC um, 26, which is short. Oh, I've got it now. And T, the next one, it's, uh, it comes after that. It's two after that. Thank you. And uh, if your lordship will note, I was reading at the foot of the page, Article 1. Yes. All disputes of every kind between Germany and Czechoslovakia with regard to which the parties are in conflict as to their respective rights in which it may not be possible to settle amicably by the normal methods of diplomacy shall be submitted for decision either to an arbitral tribunal or to the permanent court of international justice as laid down hereafter. It is agreed that the disputes referred to above include in particular those mentioned in Article 13 of the Covenant of the League of Nations. This provision does not apply to disputes arising out of events prior to the present treaty and belonging to the past. Disputes for the settlement of which a special procedure is laid down in other conventions in force between the high contracting parties shall be settled in conformity with the provisions of these conventions. Articles 2 to 21 are machinery, <coughs> and Article 22, the second sentence, says the it, that's the present treaty, shall enter into and remain in force under the same conditions as the said treaty, <coughs> the, which is the Treaty of Mutual Guarantee. <coughs> now, the, uh, that, uh, I think, is all that uh, I need mention about <coughs> that treaty. I think I'm right that my friend Mr. Alderman referred to it, uh, this was certainly the fact that it was the treaty to which um, President Benes unsuccessfully appealed during the crisis in the autumn of 1938. Now, the <coughs> ninth treaty which I should deal with is not in this um, document book, and I'm merely putting it in formally because my friend Mr. Roberts will deal with it and read the appropriate parts, uh, if the tribunal would be good enough to note it, because it's mentioned in charge 9 of Appendix C. It's the arbitration convention between Germany and Belgium, also done at Locarno, of which I hand in a copy so to, for convenience as GB 15. It's the, in, in fact, I tell the tribunal it's an exact, all the, uh, these arbitration conventions are in the same form. But I'm not going to deal with it because it's essentially part of the case concerned with Belgium, the Low Countries and Luxembourg, which my friend Mr. Roberts will present. If I only ask the tribunal to accept the, the formal document for the moment. And the same applies to the Tenth Treaty, which is mentioned in charge 10 of Appendix C, uh, C, that is the arbitration treaty between Germany and Poland, which I ask the tribunal to take notice, and I hand in as GB 16. That again will be dealt with by my friend <coughs> Colonel Griffith Jones when he's dealing with the Polish case. I therefore can take the tribunal straight uh, to a matter which is not a treaty but is a solemn declaration and that is TC 18 which I now put in as G exhibit GB 17 and ask the tribunal to take judicial notice of as a declaration of the Assembly of the League of Nations. The importance 
is the date which was the 24th of September 1927 the tribunal may remember that I asked them to take judicial notice of the fact that Germany had become a member of the League of Nations on the 10th of September 1926, a year before. The importance of this declaration is not only its effect in international law, which my learned friend, the Attorney General, referred to, but the fact that it was unanimously adopted by an assembly of the League of which Germany was a free and, let me say at once, an active member at the time. I think that all I need read of TC 18 is, if, you, if the tribunal would be good enough to look at the speech begins Monsieur Sokal of Poland, rapporteur, and then the translation, after the rapporteur had dealt with the formalities that this had been gone to the third committee and been unanimously adopted, that he had been asked to act as rapporteur, he says, the second paragraph, the committee was of opinion that at the present juncture, a solemn resolution passed by the assembly declaring that wars of aggression must never be employed <coughs> as a means of settling disputes between states and that such wars constitute an international crime would have a salutary effect on public opinion and would help to create an atmosphere favourable to the League's future work in the matter of security and disarmament while recognizing that the draft resolution does not constitute a regular legal instrument which would be adequate in itself and represent a concrete contribution towards security, the third committee unanimously agreed as to its great moral and educative value. Then he asks the assembly to adopt the draft resolution and I read simply the terms of the resolution which shows what so many nations including Germany put forward at that time. The assembly recognizing the solidarity which unites the community of nations being inspired by a firm desire for the maintenance of general peace, being convinced that a war of aggression can never serve as a means of settling international disputes and is in consequence an international crime, considering that a solemn renunciation of all wars of aggression would tend to create an atmosphere of general confidence calculated to facilitate the progress of the work undertaken with a view to disarmament, declares, one, that all wars of aggression are and shall always be prohibited, two, that every pacific means must be employed to settle disputes of every description which may arise between states. The, the Assembly that? declares that the states members of the League are under an obligation to conform to these principles. And after a solemn vote taken in the form of roll call, the President announced, which you will see at the end of the extract, all the delegations having pronounced in favour of the declaration submitted by the Third Committee, I declare it unanimously adopted. What was the date of that? The, 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 the date? 27th of September, 1920. 24th of September, 1927. <laughs>
24th of September, 1927. Yes, Germany has joined the League on the 10th of September, 1926. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the last <coughs> general treaty which I have to place before the tribunal is the Kellogg-Briand Pact, the Pact of Paris of 1928, which my learned friend, the Attorney General, in opening this part of the case, read in extenso and commented on fully. I hand in as exhibit GB 18, the British document TC 19, which is a copy of that pact. I do, did, did not intend, unless the tribunal desired otherwise, that I should read it again as the Attorney General yesterday read it in full, because I'm at the service of the tribunal. And therefore, I, I leave that document before the tribunal in that way. Now, all that remains for me to do is to place before the tribunal certain documents which Mr. Alderman mentioned in the course of his address and left to me. I'm afraid that I haven't kept them, placed them in, in, in special order because they don't really relate to the treaties I've dealt with but to Mr. Alderman's argument. The first of these is, um, I hand in as exhibit GB 19, it's British document TC 26 and comes just after that resolution of the League of Nations which the tribunal have just been giving attention. TC 26. <coughs> it's the assurance contained in Hitler's speech, again, uh, of the 21st of May, 1935. Um, and it's very short, uh, and unless the tribunal have it in mind from Mr. Alderman's speech, I'll read it again. I'm not, I'll read it. I'm not sure if it is reading it again. Germany neither intends nor wishes to interfere in the domestic affairs of Austria, to annex Austria or to attach that country to her. The German people and the German government have, however, the very comprehensible desire arising out of the simple feeling of solidarity due to a common national descent that the right to self-determination should be guaranteed not only to foreign nations, but to the German people everywhere. I myself believe that no regime which is not anchored in the people, supported by the people and desired by the people, can exist permanently. <clears throat> The next document, which is TC 22, and which is on the next page, is uh, the, I now <coughs> hand in as exhibit GB 19, <coughs> and is the official, the copy of the official proclamation of the agreement between the German government and the government of the Federal State of Austria on July 11th, 1936. And 
I'm almost certain that Mr. Alderman did read this document, but I refer the tribunal to paragraph one to remind them of the essential content. The German government recognizes the full sovereignty of the federal state of Austria in the sense of the pronouncements of the German leader and chancellor of the 21st of May 1935. <clears throat> that is the <clears throat> that I hand in <clears throat> as GB20. I, <clears throat> I, no I now have three documents which Mr. Alderman asked me to hand in with regard to Czechoslovakia. The first is TC 27, <clears throat> which um, the tribunal will find two documents further on from the one on Austria which I've just been referring. <clears throat> and that is the German assurance to <coughs> Czechoslovakia and uh, what I am handing in as GB21 is <coughs> the letter from Monsieur Masaryk, Monsieur Dan Masaryk, son, to Lord Halifax on the dated the 12th of March 1938. <clears throat> um, again, I think that Mr. Alderman did read this. He certainly quoted the statement made by the defendant Goering, which appears in the third paragraph. In the first statement, the field marshal used the expression Ich gebe Ihnen mein Ehrenwert, which I understand means I gave my word of honor. And uh, if you would, would look, if you look, look down three paragraphs, <clears throat> the, after the defendant Goering had asked that there would not be a mobilization of the Czechoslovak army. It, the <coughs> communication continues. Monsieur Masny was in a position to give him definite and binding assurances on this subject. <coughs> and today <coughs> spoke with Baron von Neurath, that's the defendant von Neurath, who among other things assured him on behalf of her Hitler that Germany still considers herself bound by the German-Czechoslovak arbitration convention concluded at Locarno in October 1925. So there, there I reminded the tribunal that in 1925 Herr Stresemann was speaking on behalf of Germany in an agreement voluntarily concluded. Had there been the slightest doubt of that, here is the defendant von Neurath giving an assurance on behalf of Hitler that Germany still considers herself bound by the German-Czechoslovak arbitration convention in the 12th of March 1938 six months before Dr. Benesch made a hopeless appeal to it before the crisis in the autumn of 1938. <clears throat> There's, um, of course, the, Czechoslov the difficult position of the Czechoslovak government is set out in the last paragraph, but Monsieur Masaryk says the tribunal may think with great force in his last sentence they cannot, however, fail to view with great apprehension the sequel of events in Austria, 
between the date of the bilateral agreement between Germany and Austria, 11th July 1936, and yesterday, 11th March 1938. <coughs> I re refrain from comment, but I venture to say that that is one of the most pregnant sentences relating to this period. Now, the next document, which is on the next page, is um, the British document TC28, which I hand in as exhibit GB22, and that is an assurance of the 26th of September 1938, which Hitler gave to Czechoslovakia. And again, the tribunal will check my memory. I don't think that Mr. Alderman read this, but I'm... No, I don't think so. Then I, I think if he didn't, uh, the tribunal ought to have it before him. Because it, it gives a very important point as to the um, alleged governing principle of getting Germans back to the Reich, which the Nazi conspirators purposed to act for a considerable time while it suited them. It says, I have little to explain. I am grateful to Mr. Chamberlain for all his efforts, and I have assured him that the German people want nothing but peace. But I've also told him that I cannot go back beyond the limits of our patience. Tribunal will remember this is between the Godesberg visit and the Munich pact. I assured him, moreover, and I repeat it here, that when this problem is solved, there will be no more territorial problems for Germany in Europe. And I further assured him that from the, mo from the moment when Czechoslovakia solves its other problems, that is to say, when the Czechs have come to an agreement with their other minorities, peacefully and without oppression, I will no longer be interested in the Czech state. And that, as far as I am concerned, I will guarantee it. We don't want any Czechs. But I must also declare before the German people that in the Sudeten German problem, my patience is now at an end. I made an offer to Herr Benesch, which was no more than the realization of what he had already promised. He has now peace or war in his hands. Either he will accept this offer and at length give the Germans their freedom, or we shall get this freedom for ourselves. Less than six months before the 15th of March, Hitler was saying in the most violent terms that he didn't want any checks. The tribunal has heard the sequel from my friend Mr. Alderman this morning. The last document which I've been asked to put in, which I now ask the tribunal to take notice of and hand in exhibit GB23, which is the British document TC23 and a copy of the Munich Agreement of September 29th, 1938. That was uh, signed by Hitler, the late Mr. Neville Chamberlain, Monsieur Deladier, and Marcellini. And it is largely a procedural agreement by which the entry of German troops into the Sudeten Deutsch territories is regulated. That is shown by the preliminary clause. Germany, the United Kingdom, France and Italy, taking into consideration the agreement, which has been already reached in principle for the, the cession to Germany of the Sudeten German territory, have agreed on the following terms and conditions governing the said session. 
and the measures consequent thereon. And by this agreement, they each hold themselves responsible for the steps necessary <coughs> to secure fulfilment. Then I don't think, unless the tribunal want me, I need go through the steps. In Article 4, it said that the occupation by stages of the predominantly German territory by German troops will begin on the 1st of October. And the four territories are marked on a map. And by Article 6, the final determination of the frontiers should be carried out by the International Commission. And it provides also for various um, um, rights of option and release from the um, forces of the, the Czech forces of Sudeten German. Well, that was what Hitler was asking for in the somewhat rhetorical passage which I've just read out. And it will be observed that there is an annex to the agreement which is most significant. Annex to the agreement, His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom and the French government have entered into the above agreement on the basis that they stand by the offer contained in paragraph 6 of the Anglo-French proposals of the 19th September relating to an international guarantee of the new boundaries of the Czechoslovak state against unprovoked aggression and the question of the Polish and Hungarian minorities in Czechoslovakia has been settled Germany and Italy for their part will give a guarantee to Czechoslovakia. Polish and Hungarian minorities, not the question of Slovakia, which the tribunal heard this morning. That is why Mr. Alderman submitted, and I respectfully join him in his submission, that the action of the 15th of March was a flagrant violation of the letter and spirit of that agreement. That, my lord, is the part of the case for which I desire to present. We will adjourn now for ten minutes. Your lordship, please.